Good evening, everybody. I'm Juan Carlos Arciniegas from CNN, Latin America. Uh, welcome to this screening. For me, as a Colombian, it's a very important film. Um, I think it's a film that does not leave anybody um, untouched or indifferent. Uh, and I saw it already twice, and I think it's a better, it gets better with uh, more viewings. So I want to um, welcome the director, Alejandro Landes. Hi. Um, and I'd like to welcome Doctora Julia Nicholson. And uh, we also have uh, Pata Grande Bigfoot in the house. Moises, please. Hello, Julian. How are you, Moises? Hello. How are you? Bien, gracias. Okay. Um, so, I have more questions, even though we did a, an extensive interview yesterday. Um, but I want to know why may, you made Alejandro the decision not to give us, for Colombians it's very clear that it's part of our history, violence and, and political uh, turmoil in Colombia, but why you made the decision not to give us places, name of places, dates, any of that? Is it because you wanted to keep it as a fantasy maybe? Tell. Yeah, that was something that uh, that I thought a lot about of about uh, a lot, and it comes from the screenplay, and and I think it comes from basically two places. One is um, the country I come from, Colombia, that we come from, which is a country that suffered 60 years of civil war, where there's so many different factions and actors from the left, from the right, paramilitary, guerrilla, narcos, the state, foreign intervention. And even those groups are broken up into subgroups. And, um, and it's been going on for so long. And the nature of that conflict has become like a shadow war. And that's very similar to conflict as we see today. Um, you know, I, my, my father's father, my grandfather, he fought in World War II, landed in Normandy, he's actually from California. And, um, you know, World War II had these more clean front lines and, and flags. And today, you don't have that. Uh, you know, most, most of the fighting happens in uh, covert operations, shadow operations from the back lines. And, and I felt that to make a, a film that, um, that in some way speaks to the war film genre, then I had to do something, something new, and I think something that would force you to, to leave aside ideology and grasp onto the humanity of those people that are there, whether they represent the left or the right. It didn't, it didn't really matter to me because I thought that you, you didn't have any of that, any of that information to latch onto. And generally, we put stickers on things, right? Is it, uh, you know, are they, are they left or right, or, or, or who are they representing? And then I thought that it would just really force this fairy tale, force this metaphor for you to latch on to what you have there, which is the present humanity of the characters. How many of you knew before coming here tonight that it was going to be a Colombian story? Just a few, okay. Julian, uh, what do you know about the Colombia history before getting involved in this uh, project? And what or who helped you to, to get into the skin of La Doctora? Uh, I didn't know anything about the Colombian history, really, and I learned through Alejandro. I learned through being in that place, and I learned through reading a number of stories of people who had been kidnapped and held hostage for various periods of time. And that was my, my, my deep learning curve. And after finishing, what's, what's your take on Colombia now? I love Colombia. I was, uh, it's such a special place. You know, all, all that we know about Colombia really in this country is, is, it's terrible. It's such a small view, but it's, you know, cocaine in the 80s. It was a scary place. It was a dangerous place. My experience were, was and has been, and I hope will continue to be, the, the people that I've met have been the most most generous, most welcoming. Um, I just felt so embraced, and they felt like I just felt they were so happy to have me there to be a part of telling the story and um, the beauty of of nature there and the warmth and humor and joy in the people. It's just 
it just got under my skin, and I, I, I deeply love Colombia and, and the people there. However, it was not easy for you to shoot him. No, but this we'll, was a nightmare. <laughs> we'll talk about it. But Moises, you, you were raised, no, you were born in New York, right? right. But you are Colombian, you have Colombian blood. Um, how do you see this as a film that represents part of your, your heart? I mean, uh, I've always um, wanted to um, tell a story or be a part of a story um, in Colombia. And from the moment that uh, I, I read the script or even just um, heard about it um, in an email, I, I thought that it was a special opportunity to, to be a part of something um, that did tell a different uh, side of, of Colombia. And um, even though it does um, speak on something that as Alejandro said, it has been going on for many years. Um, I think it's told in a very, um, in, in, in a way that um, really the world can um, kind of see. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, Latin American or anything like that. I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story, it's an international story, it's a universal story. I'm talking about the script. Um, you didn't give them a script, did you? And you change it. I mean, you wrote a script, but then you were changing it once you met all of them, all of the pack, in a way. But you didn't give them the script because I was doing more research today, right. and that's what I got from them. Well, basically, I had people that had a tremendous amount of experience, like Julianne and Moises, with me. Um, but then I also had um, some kids that had never been before a, a camera in their lives. And so I actually approach each one of them somewhat differently, and particularly the ones that didn't have experience. Um, what we did in the casting process was we looked at over 800 kids throughout Colombia, finally chose about 25 finalists and brought them to this mock boot camp. And they did acting and improv exercises. And those were done with parts of the screenplay, but they just thought there were random scenes designed for acting and improv exercises. They didn't know there was the screenplay. And then in the afternoon, we did um, military uh, drills, but not regular military boot stomping, because the idea was to create this clandestine army, this imagined shadow army. And, and so we um, did that. And by having these uh, young people together for these weeks of living, showering, eating together, I started to see that mini society develop. You know, the who liked who, who flirted with who, who didn't like who, and then, and then, and and I rewrote the screenplay, I adjusted it to make sure that the final eight that I would choose would be reflected on the page and not only just impose the page on them, but actually bring that in because they, they were non-professional actors and some of them were as young as I think 12 or 13 when they were shooting like Smurf. And uh, you're talking about improvisation and uh, Moise says, I think it was difficult for you because of all your colleagues, you were the one who was formally trained as an actor and they were not. So did you have to change? the way you approach the role because you have to uh, adapt to them? Um, I think the biggest thing was the language. Um, this was the first time I did a feature in, in Spanish and all these kids, as Alejandro said, are from um, all the, uh, uh, um, um, let's call them states, from all the areas of Colombia, uh, very authentic kids. And to be, um, kind of a leader or to be antagonistic towards them um, and not have the language to do so um, was was difficult, uh, especially when the camera kept on rolling and you know, the, the, the scene that was on the page finished, but um, Alejandro saw something else that he wanted to capture and you just have to, you just have to continue. You're not just gonna look around and become silent all of a sudden. So um, that was definitely the toughest part of, you know, working with them. And Julianne, now we're going to talk about your experience because most of them don't speak English, right? Yeah. However, you have to spend the whole day with them and you have to create this chemistry with them. How, how did you adapt to that too? Well, there were two things that were happening. One was um, Alejandro wanted to create separation between us. Uh, they were very much a crew living together 24-7, doing everything. They all were in the same, living in the same tent or cabin and I was always on my own, my own tent, my own place. So I was grateful for that, but it was also very isolating and very lonely making. Um, that said, they're also kids and they wanna see 
somebody new and they want to ask questions and Smurf and Lady in particular would they just talk. To, they loved me. They oh would practically goodness. sit on my lap like at every moment they could. And I didn't like that. I didn't. He like didn't that. like that. But they, <laughs> they would they would speak to me in rapid fire Spanish. I didn't understand a word they said. And they would laugh and. And uh, Smurf would sing, hello. <laughs> he would sing Adele. So uh, two things were happening at all times. And, and, and uh, when, when it called for the separation and that. But you know, it's also, it's an interesting thing. I read these books and you know, when you're captive, you have, it's the lowest of the low that are, that are looking after these people, right? And so you have different personalities and they make, their relationships are formed between <laughs> Um, captor and prisoner, and sometimes it's almost a friendship. It's a very strange dynamic to have both of those things going on, and I felt I felt like we did. What, what Juliana is saying is interesting: is that uh, as fantastic as it may seem, it's actually quite common, not only in Colombia, that you know the high command may have this kidnapped person, and they're trying to negotiate uh, some type of economic or political leverage, but the cheapest way of taking care of the hostage, and while they negotiate, is giving it to the lowest rung of the ladder. Many times those are the youngest, you know, soldiers, and um, and many times kids. And so we actually read, and, and Julianne read several first-hand accounts of people, of high profile or not, that had been in the hands of of, of kids. And so you had this almost Neverland scenario uh, that was um, that was kind of very frightening. You know? Yesterday I was talking to a friend who saw the film and she was telling me that one of the most compelling and touching uh, scenes were your scene in the cave with um, Sueca, yeah. right? Um, how many times do you have to do that scene to, to give us so much different emotions at the same time? Do you remember? No. Uh, how many times? A, a few times, I think. One explosion. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was... Uh, Would you um, it was a very peculiar scene because Julianne has something, and I'm very has something very lovable and, ma and almost maternal that the sweetness to her and, and a very iconic look. But she also had to turn violent, and that's a scene where there's a very thin line between uh, desire, desire for human and physical connection, but at the same time, um, I think like repulsion and 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 uh, the fear for your life. And I think we practiced that in a, a container that was up there in the mountain mm -hmm. a little bit. And, um, and then we gave it a go. I don't, I don't think it was that many takes, actually. No, yeah. How many weeks was uh, the shooting? Nine weeks of shooting, split. Which evenly. is what you uh, thought at the beginning, or it changed? I mean, I think we had the budget for like six. <laughs> 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 but uh, we really, yeah, we just kept going, going. But the real foundations of the film were these uh, about five weeks before we shot the first frame to, to create this brotherhood, this sisterhood, having them, people that had never seen each other in their lives, having them spend this time together in a place with no cell phone, uh, no domestic comforts, and they were there in the same space. Julianne was separate because I wanted to make sure that that, that was separate, but this band that, that, um, that are the Monos were, were together the whole time, and that's what really made the difference. And the locations, especially the, the National Park, it's not that far away from civilization. However, you, you, Julian, you were explaining yesterday how to get there. It was it's a long trip. It was two one fl long flight to Colombia, Bogota. That was, the, that was the jungle. Going to the jungle. Okay. Yes. Which, how was it? It was uh, from LA. Yes, it's two flights, and then a three-hour car journey on a paved road. Then you get to a town, <laughs> and then you're about an hour on a dirt road, and then you unload and you hike down um, for about an hour. You can take a donkey. I chose not. Um, and then you get on a raft. And it was so funny because it was described to me what this journey would be, but you still it, you, you don't really believe it. And then I saw the raft, and I was like, oh, like a like a raft. We're getting on a raft, <laughs> and we're rafting there. And that's how that's how they got the equipment there. I mean, it was it was it was a grueling, physically, practically crazy thing. That how many did. times you said to yourself, why I did this. Why did I say yes? I, you know what? I had one night where also we in the jungle. I was in I was in a tent and it it poured with rain every single night, torrential rain and lightning and thunder. Um, and one night there was a flashlight. And you know when you come down the down this raft on this river, you see 
where people are living, which is literally under a piece of plastic. So this is where, where some people are living in the in this jungle. And um, a, a flashlight happened to go across my tent a few times. And I suddenly thought to myself, did I ask all the questions <laughs> that I was should that I should have asked? And you know, we were all It was all, me. And yeah, Alejandro, he's got some like voodoo magic. But um when I got home, I dreamt about the jungle every night. And I think it was a way of processing that experience because actually while you're there, I couldn't afford to actually think about the dangers in a real way because it they were they were present. I bet they were. And Moises, am I lying if I said this is the most rewarding role you ever made so far? You're very young, but. Uh, I, I believe so. I mean, it was the most difficult and it, uh, probably the prettiest as well, like the most beautiful. So um, that's all that you um, really dream of uh, when, when trying to uh, make something like this is hopefully all this work and all these injuries aren't for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what does the river symbolize? So I was looking at the very end and I said, you were talking about the pace of the film, the editing, but what else? Well, the water for me was kind of the main structural element of the edit. Uh, the film begins in this highland, which is actually a wetland about 13,000 feet up in the air. And it's actually the reservoir of water of Colombia up there. And it's a very delicate ecosystem. And the water trickles down the mountain, gaining gaining more speed, winding down the mountain until it ends up in these torrents in the low country. And of course, it condensates and then becomes clouds again. And so something between the cyclical nature of water and the cyclical nature of violence, and I was always thinking, and that was a tough thing of the film, I'm not going to take you through the point of view of one or two characters. I'm actually going to have almost this pinball effect where you're in the river, changing point of view consistently, and you're just winding down this river at different speeds uh, until you end up in those torrents at the end. And, and the film allows itself to play within or flirt within different genres, be it action or a war film or a coming of age. And, um, and water w was key. I mean, it was, it was something I had in my mind, but to make it work in the edit well, was tough with all these elliptical jumps to make a film that was, was somewhat um, ghostly. Because as, as you know, um, you know, war, I mean, war is something that's accompanied us as a species, and, and as Colombians, it's not the first time there's the potential of peace, and and it's not the first time it it, it could be it could break down, um, and so I wanted to make sure that we played with time as well, create like an a temporal feel. Sometimes it looks like you could be in a an apocalyptic future, and that's other times it could it looks like you'd be in the past. Um, so yeah, it was that was that's what I had in my mind. And uh, there's also, at the beginning, I, I think we, we talked about it yesterday, about let's talk about sound and, and music. You didn't want music, didn't need music, the film that you considered. No, no, I, I always oh. thought uh, music was something I had in my mind, but when the British composer Mika Levy, you might know her from Under the Skin or Jackie, uh, when she watched the film, an, uncut, an unfinished uh, um, cut of the film, she said, oh, I like it like this. You don't really need music. Um, but no, but then we started talking and we worked on it. But there's actually surprisingly little music. There's only 22 minutes of music, even though it has such a presence. And again, the uh, temporal feel, you have sounds that are very primal, elemental, like blowing into a bottle, juxtaposed with a uh, string quarteto, quarteto. And then you have like um, sounds that could come out of a nightclub, like completely digital sounds. And th that helps you know, play with your notion of time. It's kind of dis disorienting, but I think in a way that's that's very moving. And we also took a note from like Peter and the Wolf where the characters have musical notes. So for example, the character of the messenger, which we can talk about, is um, every time that, that he shows up, you have that do, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Which is this kind of epic, almost spaghetti Western kind of feel to it. And the idea is that that symbolizes the organization, the authority that's lording over this squad of, um, of young rebels. Well, let's talk about The Messenger, because there's something beautiful about it, right? Yeah, well, The Messenger was originally a guy that I met in a reinsertion program that the government had for rebel fighters that had either from paramilitary groups or guerrilla groups lay down their arms and trying to get back into society. And uh, while I was doing my research, and we were looking at all sorts of things, like the uniforms Russia wore to get into Crimea, what's going on in Syria, uh, rebel Rastafari movements in the 60s. I mean, we looked at all sorts of different um, 
uh, insurgent armies. And, and while I was doing my research, I, I, I came upon this guy that had entered um, a rebel group in Colombia uh, when he was 11 and rose to become to like the Navy SEALs of this group, let's say. I mean, he was really a renowned fighter. And, but he deserted when he was 25. And, in, and I brought him on board so he could lead these physical training exercises and help me imagine how this army moved, right? And he'd been, he, and he is a real student of war. The guy had seen like Viet Cong videos, I mean, everything. Um, and he was so incredible in the training sessions in this, at the beginning of, the, of, um, of pre production that I'm like, no, I'm bringing you on the other side of the camera. And he's actually the guy that plays the messenger. He's Wilson, he's the, he's the real thing. I want to, we're fin I want to finish. But uh, Julian, I know that uh, Alejandro is not trying to send a political message here. That's the least of his intentions. But you as a person, or as an actress, or an actor, uh, what is the reflection that you would do about this story? As a human being. Uh, as, well, for me, felt I felt excited to be a part of bringing this story to my country, to this country, to opening up people's eyes to this experience. We, we are so, the entertainment that we're fed, it's getting a little better, but it's, it's so, you know, with borders. It's so, it's in English. It's, you know, people we know. It's, it doesn't really venture far off that. So I learned so much while I was making the movie, and I hope that people who get to see it will will have a, a similar a similar experience. That there's a lot of there are things happening outside of our country that are important, and hopefully bring some humanity to that. I feel Moises last one, but um, with the ending, that it's an open ending. I would like to see more of this. I would like to know what happened when Rambo arrives into the other jungle, right, mm -hmm. which is with bricks and. Payment concrete, thank you. Uh, would you like to see a continuation of this? I mean, that would be really interesting. I don't know um, if I survived that rapid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. The, um, Pitufo's on a, on, a, on a trunk of a tree, you know, and <laughs> Perro maybe went back with Lady. I'm, I, I'm unsure, but um, I, I think um, where we're at in that in that open ending leads to conversation and, and leads to what we just uh, discussed. You know, what could be. All right, and I just want to say thank you again. And this is a great uh, film. And again, I think second viewing. Earth, I want to see it again for a third time. I don't know why people get that right. Get that feeling of seeing it again. Yes, a lot of people. We I, I've had a couple of friends see it, and the first thing they say to me is, "I want to see it again." Well, I mean, the film that. I Film, I think, that has this unique capacity to play to the conscious and the subconscious mind, like linger like a dream. So I think the film really navigates that between something that is born out of reality. We're talking about a lot of reality here, but also there's something that appeals to kind of the stomach, to the skin, and not only the mind. And I think the film and the film that I like has that waking dream uh, uh, feel. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming.